It's time once again for the Real People Multi-Game Solitaire Mega Tournament. I was going to do the, um, at the end of the last careers uh, video, I had said I was go going to do medical next. I decided to do sports instead, uh, partially because I want to review this game, and I thought maybe I could use some of this footage from the Real People Multi-Game Solitaire Mega Tournament also in the review as well, um, just because I'm so limited on time. So if I can, you know get two of these little birds with one stone. That's great. Um, and also because the medical game wasn't full and I, I had allocated so many doctor slots for um, for the game of careers that I would have had four playing in this doctor game and that would have left just one slot left. So it, it just would have been too awkward. So hopefully someone else will go to college soon and be able to fill out that doctor roster and we can let those people play. So what we're going to do now, if you recall last time I also made the error of having too many people allowed in the sporting friends portion of careers. Um, so we're going to remedy that with this game. Now, as you can see, we have nine people here, which I don't have a lot of games that are supposed to seat nine, and this one isn't supposed to either. It's supposed to go four to eight, but I see no reason why you can't do it with nine, especially if you just, you know you don't really have the time constraints that you would have with uh, with people. I think it, this would probably this might be very uh, quite a bit of a big mess with uh, if you played with with actual humans with nine people, but it's probably doable, and we're going to do it right now regardless. Um, so whoever wins this uh, is going to get a big jump in the next game of the Sporting Friends. So unlike the other careers, we're actually going to have two games in this kind of little offshoot of careers for sports, um, which kind of makes sense because there's so many people too. So that whoever wins is going to get a big bonus. Um, whoever loses is going to get hit pretty hard, I think. Um, probably probably several people are going to get hit pretty hard. So um, I'll, just, I'll just let you know. The next game is going to be a kind of tournament. That's that's the, how the game's played. So whoever wins this is actually going to be going to face the finalist of that tournament. So they get to skip the whole tournament essentially by winning this game. So what is this game? This game is Power Play. Um, Power Play is a storytelling game with a with a strong competitive element. Um, when I do the review of this game, I'll talk about what a story game is. Um, I would say it's a story game with a strong competitive element or a board game with a strong story game element. But if you don't know what story games are, you should look that up. They're not the same as role-playing games, and that's that's important to understand to appreciate this game. Um, in the board game world, I would probably compare this game most in terms of uh, kind of the goal of play in some ways um, to Once Upon a Time in that there's... Kind of the the purpose of the game is to tell a good story, but there's a, it's also to win, um, kind of in the same balance as that game. Okay, so you 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 got to play this game with kind of the story in mind as a goal. The process is a big goal, unlike most competitive games or most board games. Even if you like care about the process, really the goal of the game play itself is just well. I don't know, we can go on that, but it, it, ostensibly you're supposed to just care about being a winner. So what's going on in this game is um, there's a lot of different ways to play this game, but kind of standard, and I'm going pretty standard here to just kind of show you. Um, there's a common element, okay, and here we have a shrunken head. And before we started play, each of our real people um, inhabited my body and had me write down a secret goal f that someone would have to do with this shrunken head. Okay, whoever completes their secret goal first wins. Um, now what the shrunken head serves to kind of like make sure that they all have to interact in getting the secret goal because you can only do your secret goal if you have the shrunken head and they're all written in there. Um, so then the secret goals which are on these sleeps of paper got put in a pile and mixed up. So generally you're not going to get the secret goal that you wrote um, and it kind of, kind of makes for an interesting situation where the, since they're secret, the person who's most likely to stymie you is the person who wrote that secret goal. Okay, so that's one part of the game. Um, to facilitate that, your ability to do that, everyone has a secret special identity, and that's that's like a set of powers that they have. They can't use those powers unless they reveal them. Well, unless they're using them secretly, and that's a whole other mechanism in the game. Um, 
You don't always want to reveal those powers, one, because people can stymie you more if they know what power you have. Um, they might be less likely to be afraid of you, too, like well, Stubby here, he's the Mimic. The Mimic, unless he's learned some... The Mimic, it's nice for the Mimic to, to have his power secret because um, he can copy what other people do. Uh, but if they knew he was the Mimic, they wouldn't let him. Another another big reason you don't want to let your power be known is Danimal here, and people don't know he's this, is the Reaper. And I recommend putting the Reaper in when you play this game for this reason. The Reaper has the ability to just kill someone if he knows who they are. So you really want to be, be secretive about who you are. Otherwise, whoever's the Reaper can probably get you. And um, you have to be in the same space as the Reaper, too, for that to happen. So it's not like he can just kill you wherever. And also, if you die in this game, you get a comeback. You just don't get your power anymore. So it's, it's a big hindrance. You don't really want to die, but it's not the end of the game for you if you do. Um, Everyone's in charge of one location here, and they're called the secret keeper of these locations. So we have stadium, suburb, downtown, um, different locations there. Uh, that's because, you know, throughout play, people are going to be doing things that other people don't know that they're doing. The secret keeper is still going to know what they're doing. So say if Weasel wanted to, to like secretly plant a seed in the nature preserve. He would write that on a slip of paper and put it under there. Danimal would look at it, make sure that was okay. And then that would that would occur. And then later on, if that came up, you know, maybe that's part of a goal or something, he could say, no, it's there. And Dan would be like, yep, it's there. So um, that's how you do secret things in, in locations. Now, interestingly, Danimal can't do anything secret in the nature preserve because he's the own secret keeper. There's no, no one to check that. And this game is very freeform in a way. It's kind of got these, these centered things that center it. There's the, the common element that centers things. There's the secret keeper that checks it. And then like almost anything in the game can be subject to a reality check. And maybe I'll get a visual aid out and explain how that works one second. Here's a visual, here's a visual aid from the rule book. Um, so the game kind of, it's like self self GMing, game mastering for, for role playing terms. Um, the the group kind of does those roles. So we already have the secret keeper where that happens. Um, here it's a reality check. So if someone thinks that something oh, so to understand the reality check, I guess I should explain actions. To to do an action, you basically just say you do it, and you say it in the affirmative that you do it because all the all the characters are very capable and they can do pretty much anything a human can do. If someone doesn't believe you can do it, a reality check happens. Um, and there's arguments and people vote. And the arguments are real short, otherwise the game gets really bogged down. People vote. And then um, if the vote is in favor of the action being possible, um, if it's if it's then it, it just happens. If it's not in favor and it's not unanimously against uh, and the person who's doing the action doesn't get to do it. Then two dice are, are rolled. And if you get a five or a six, in this case they did, then the action still can happen. So even if, if the people are against you, as long as someone believes that what you're attempting is possible, um, you still have a chance of making it happen. And so you can, you can actually do a rail check on anything in the game. The most common thing is with an action, but it could be like a rules issue, you know, because the, the, the rules don't cover everything. One thing I've run into in the past is what happens, and maybe it's in here and I just didn't see it, what happens if you want to go somewhere that there isn't a location card for? Like if you want to go to the store, there's no store here. Um, now we're fortunate we have downtown, so there's probably a store there, but if you don't have the downtown card, what do you do? Um, and, you know, we made a ruling on that. If you play this game with your own group, you can make your own ruling on that. And then, you know, each time you play, you can make different rules. Um, so if it, if it doesn't go in favor, then you can amend it. And that's the final part of the reality check. So the game's kind of self-regulating in that way. And you really can't get down to a hard, fast rule argument, which you could see for a game like this, where you could end up just arguing about rules especially if you're playing more competitively. And that's, that's kind of an interesting tension in the game, the competitive versus the story. Um, you really got to, you know, be aware of that process and have that be important to you, I think, to enjoy this. Um, though you can be really nasty in the competition as well. Um, so I think I've given you a good enough overview. People have their little pawns here. They can call these people for help. I'll explain that when it comes up. Um, Maybe we should, do you want to know their secret goals or should I make that secret? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just make that secret. 
Yeah, let's do that. We'll make that secret. Since I'm being kind of cagey about the secret goals, I guess I will let you in on who picked what trait for the locations. Now, when you start the game, you pick, you take turns picking traits for locations. Traits are an important part of the game I also didn't explain, so I guess this serves a double purpose. Um, traits are things in brackets here, and the rules don't really specify where you write those things in brackets, but our players can have traits, um, locations can have traits, and basically if a, if a location has a trait, you can use that to argue why something would occur or why such a thing would be possible. So kind of how the game is played, you kind of want to set up things so that people don't necessarily know what you're doing and then in one fell swoop you can get what you want and end the game before anyone can stop you. Okay, so you kind of want to, although all the players are very powerful, they need to be able to go slow and kind of add things a little bit at a time um, and nudge things just the right amount so that they can, you know, be the first one to be successful, but also um, not have anyone catch on to what they're up to. So this is the first step in that, assigning traits to the locations. And they can assign more traits, you know, part, part of this game um, is you can, you can assign traits at any time. So people are assigning traits and each of those has to go through a reality check often um, if people don't agree with the traits. And so it can get kind of bogged down. When we play, we, we tend not to just do traits willy-nilly. Um, usually we just do it on our own turn and then we do it out of turn, which you're allowed to do according to the rule book when, um, when uh, it seems like it, it especially important or it might conflict. You know, you, you just kind of moderate yourself with that. So anyway, the traits people had, uh, we have downtown. Two people put traits on downtown. Smiley put bohemian and flush put busy nightlife. All right. And the head got um, randomly placed in downtown and there's our head right there. Um, and it's encased in a VIP back room of a high-end curio shop. So someone's got to be able to get back there and get the head. Um, suburbs, Weasel put the trait past its prime. Um, the stadium, Stubby had it be a gladiatorial arena for some reason. Um, Junior made the library, it's, it's going through a ribbon cutting, so the library is just opening up today in game terms. Uh, Snugbug made the airport small. Let's flip to the other side. Um, Central Bank is poorly managed, according to Kaz and Cat. Um, the construction area is sacred ground, according to Danimal. And the nature preserve, which is over there, uh, is a drought-blighted prairie. So they're trying to preserve this prairie, and um, there's not enough water, which is often the case for prairies, I suppose, or sometimes the case. So those are our starting traits. Now we're gonna, everyone's gonna pick what location they want to start on, and then we get to start playing for real. One more thing about traits before I start picking where everyone starts out. Um, one of the things about this game is it's easy to forget to put traits on yourself, um, on your own player. And then it's kind of unclear, like, who gets final say on that. I mean, presumably it's all open up to debate uh, with the reality checks and everything. But um, one way we've gotten around that in the past is to use the, the um, mundane people in the back and just kind of go randomly choose or else pick, you know, these kind of packages. Um, but a, a great way to do it is actually to use real people cards. So um, this is how we're gonna do it today. The, uh, the real people we have here, they just start out with traits. You know, you can just imagine each of their, their things here being in brackets, and that's a trait that they have. Um, so sometimes you have, to, you have to bracket the category and also the thing. So I'd like to meet Janet Jackson would all be in one bracket. Um, so that's just a trait he has that he can he can use or other people can invoke uh, when interacting with him. All right, I've gone through some turns and I haven't done a full round of turns yet, but I thought I should check in with you before I got too far ahead. So, because there's a lot of different kind of plot threads going on right now, everyone's kind of doing their own thing, um, and you might be interested to know what it is. So first, Smiley, uh, she pr proposed that there would be a drugstore, downtown drugstore. That's very common. No one could really dispute that. Um, and then she went in there and she bought some things. You can do anything in an action that you could do in 10 minutes. And she can buy anything 
that you know, uh, I guess a middle class person in the United States of America could afford. So she bought a notebook, pen, a stuffed pony, allergy medication, and tape. And that was her turn. Uh, Junior, for his part, he um, was standing in line, or he's watching the ribbon cutting, cutting ceremony at the library, and he writes a note. That was his whole action. Um, and then, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. He watched the ribbon cutting ceremony, and then he, it was, it was getting over, and then he was standing in line, and he wrote the note in line. Sorry. Um, Ka, she, cat, as in cat, she uh, is at the bank here, and she got, um, she's, she obtained an appointment to meet, uh, get a meeting for a loan, and they're doing that right away. They're not going to wait on that. They would like to uh, give her a loan if she qualifies, if at all possible. Uh, Flush, he managed to find someone selling gun in the middle of the day downtown he had to roll a reality check for that not that was not uh most people favor were were not in favor of that um but enough people said it was okay it wasn't unanimously against so he got the role and the role was successful there were some missed roles people tried to make roles that that they were not successful and we're about to do a role right now because little red um after so there's been lots of actually proposed traits for downtown downtown's been very busy i don't think there's been any other traits proposed oh there was one for the library to have uh, private study areas but that got shot down um so he's going to the the drugstore as well and he wants to buy some gasoline there <laughs> um, so most people are saying no. I'm not going to break down the votes for you, so we're going to have to vote. So if any of these are a five or a six, he can buy gasoline. Otherwise, he can't. Um, got a five, so he now has gasoline. Now, how I make note of that is gasoline is actually a trait. I don't know why I skipped Snugbug. What did Snugbug do? I don't know. Um, that's okay. We can go out of order. So now he has gas o lean written left-handedly can better okay so snugbug's gonna go directly into the curio shop and just uh suggest to the owner who has been described previously as a pipe smoking proprietor um suggest to him that he would like to s that the wares in the front weren't uh, good enough for someone of his taste and he'd really like to go back and see if there's a, anything else special there. Now, he wasn't very smooth about it. And so um, a majority of our players are thinking it doesn't work. Although many, there's a few that, that enough enough say it, it'll work that, that that's gonna allow us to roll the dice. So any fives or sixes, he gets to go back there. Otherwise, he's gonna have to make an amendment and um, I'll have to think up what that amendment will, will be. One and a two, so neither of those are fives or sixes, so let's do an amendment. Also previously established is subtle security. Now, um, Snugbug is going to um, walk up and punch the, uh, knock out the, the subtle security. Now that's not something anyone, you really need a reality check for. These people are considered good enough that they can do that. Normally they could talk their way into things too, but the way he presented it, it was, it was, it, it didn't seem like it was going to work. So the, they, they called a reality check and it didn't work. And, you know. um, so he knocks out the guy and then threatens uh, the, the pipe smoking proprietor that he's going to hurt him um, if he doesn't let him in. Now, I think a majority says that that's going to work. And so he has made entrance into the inner sanctum uh, well, not the inner sanctum, the VIP back room of the high-end curio shop. Okay, and our round of turns ends with three secret actions. And I think I will let you know what the secret actions are. I kept the goals secret, but we, we can look at our secret actions. So first of all, Danimal, he's in the library here. He is researching where the um, body for the head is buried. Um, Junior being the secret keeper, normally if this were a public action, everyone would get to decide on this or, you know, this is something they could decide on. Junior being the, the secret keeper is saying that that has to be a long action. It's going to take him too long. So basically it's going to take him two turns instead of one to do that research. And part of that is the specificity. Like he needs to find out exactly where the nature preserve uh, it's, it's buried. Um, 
so that seemed fair. The animal is not protesting that too much. Um, not that that would do any good. And then here in the high school, well, I guess we'll do Stubby's next. Stubby, he um, revealed just to the secret keeper his role of the mimic. Um, he didn't have to show him the card. He just wrote it down that he's the mimic. And he's watching gladiators fight and l getting that their fighting ability by watching them, essentially. So he's just not really doing anything for his goal necessarily, but he is becoming a more effective gladiatorial fighter. So that could come up later on. Let's try to try our best to remember that he now has that ability to fight like an a awesome gladiator. Um, Weasel is being a little weasel. He went into the, he's hiding in the high school bathroom and he's got the garbage man powers. And once again, he revealed to Kaz and Kat that he's doing, that he has this power that everyone else doesn't know that. Um, he's using his garbage man power to make people sick um, in the bathroom. So he's just getting a bunch of kids sick and he's going to stay there. Well, he's staying there this turn, which is only about 10 minutes, but he's going to, it's going to start to spread. Um, which is apparently what he wants. Um, one little thing I should clarify. I recall saying earlier that the Reaper can only kill people if they're in his same area. That was a, a rule that we decided as a group. Because um, we had some, I don't know. It, it just seemed fun. Uh, you have to be sneakier if it's the other way. I'm trying to decide which way I'm going to do it. If the Reaper can just, I, I guess we'll go with the rules as written so you can see it, how it is. Um, so the Reaper can kill people anywhere as long as he knows their uh, role. Um, or in the case of normals, which are not the player characters, what they look like. But I think we're going to stop it here for, for today. We've got a lot of exposition and we just we went through a round of turns. Um, hopefully your curiosity is piqued as to what these, these real people are up to uh, and as to when perhaps they might make their power play.